Okay, so I'm Hossein Estiri. I'm going to talk about, um, you know, future of phenotyping. There's a little bit of hot take, Sean, in it, but, you know. So, um, okay, so phenotyping, I don't need to, I think, explain this, all of the promises for scaling up and accelerating by medical research. There's challenges, it's been covered. Uh, one particular challenge that I wanna talk about with you is that phenotyping is a generalization. And if you think of it, it's basically we have, uh, first of all, there is unlimited number of phenotypes that can be defined because it's a, you know, you basically say what phenotype you wanna define and uh, whatever you do with a phenotype, it's, it's similar to, okay, what are these groups of patients look like? And it's, if you connect it with philosophy, it's like, you know, Plato's cave allegory, it's like, you know, where there is this, you have the shadow and you're seeing the shadow, right? Um, and, you know, later on, I'll tell you my allegory, cave allegory, so where EHR is the sun and then the phenotype. So we're basically doing that. We're kind of generalizing and um, uh, I'll talk about that in, in the next slide more. But then there is, it's even more complex when the phenotype is more difficult. So some of the phenotypes are difficult because they might change over time in intensity or evolve or they're not fully known like long COVID or post-acute sequel life COVID-19. Um, so on generalization, um, so basically the synonym for generalization is stereotyping or you know simplification. So this is what, you, what I got from um, an AI when I ask what does a dementia patient look like? So this is pretty much what we do with, uh, with phenotyping, right? So what does a dementia patient or what does this patient with certain characteristics look like in data? This is a generalization you can see in asthma, there is this cat always, so you can actually prompt it to remove the cat, but you know, it's, it's not too far. Um, so there is a generalization. All right, and okay, so now let's go to um, AI. To talk about AI, it's basically, AI is a mathematical, you know, kind of a function. And functions um, are basically mathematical generalization of a sample of data. So in a purely logical perspective, you know, in a fundamental principle of mathematics is that the world can be described in with numbers and relationships. And you know, think of uh, functions as input output machines, you give it a data and it's kind of like there's a function and there's an output. Now, AI, the recent AI is when there is, uh, when, there, when you basically put the compute actually allows you to build functions that can have unlimited degrees of freedom, uh, which, in a statistical sense, is basically unlimited parameters, number of number of uh, you know covariates, um, and so I basically call the new AI and LLMs basically free state of parameters, basically right. So it's unlimited in in reality, as much as the compute power allows us. Um, so now, uh, if the um, so basically the problem AI is trying to solve us is that for some of these diseases, put it into phenotyping context. We don't have a definition. What we have is a bunch of data points. So we basically put the data points that we have and then we put these algorithms. It can be a simple regression. It can be a very complicated algorithm. I mean, it tries to kind of fit a bunch of you know points and uh, fit, fit a function there that can predict, um, basically can generalize or approximate that problem or phenomena given the data points that we have and so we can use that to estimate the data points that we don't have. Now if, if you know, just ability of AI to generalize is just one of its basically um, most promising uh, kind of aspects of AI. Uh, and if it can produce generalizable function, it will make universal function approximation, but there is generalization. So there is a generalization in mathematics and computational uh, modeling, and then there is generalization in, uh, in phenotyping. So what happens is that 
um, okay, so this is the slide that is, so basically what is, uh, what I have is that, so if, ta if we talk about precision medicine, the question is, is phenotyping in contrast with precision medicine? And my short answer is yes, because, so precision medicine is basically involves tailoring medical care for individuals, um, uh, to individual, to the individual characteristics of the, each patient, and then you're talking about, um, you know, kind of like generalizing this cohort. Uh, it's a generalized cohort that there is, it, it's not perfect and it's not, it doesn't have the individual characteristics, so there is, it's, it's basically in contrast with it. So bias basically is inherent and unavoidable in any kind of generalization, especially, um, you know, in, in you know, in, when, when it's mathematical or logical or whatever type they say. So it's basically, so I, I argue that generally AI or any kind of generalization via functions, including phenotyping, diverges from the nuanced approach of precision medicine. Now what do we need? We need uh, personalized AI. Um, so what do we have? We have the data, we have the algorithms, and we have computer power, right? So um, in my model of what I call precision phenotyping, um, basically a precision phenotype model involves ensembles of um, different models. They can be rule-based models, they can be very simple models, but they can be agents, right? So a precision phenotyping algorithm is curated by com uh, com uh, including several uh, fu uh, several functions uh, into one general algorithm. And I give you an example. So an example is the work that we did on long COVID. So, um, so we wanted to define, long, and the long COVID is one of the hardest, I think, problems in phenotyping. There is no clear definition out there. We wanted to define it and we basically picked the WHO's definition as which, which says that long COVID is a diagnosis of exclusion. If you talk with a lot of primary care doctors, they, they also say the same thing. Uh, so the way we kind of started to um, define that is that we came up with these little, um, uh, little functions where you can see in this case where we had rules that you know there has to be um, so we use the sequencing algorithm. I don't want to go into details of this, but there's several little functions in it. There is a paper that we have, it's under review, and there is like detailed explanation of it online. I think I, I don't have enough time to go through this. But what happens is that when we have the entire script, at the end, uh, what we have is that for each individual person, the, uh, the definition of the phenotype, the long COVID phenotype, can be defined different, can be, can be different based on the things that we've learned. And this leads to a very precise def, uh, definition and a very precise core. So what we're using this um, approach, we've curated this, what we call precision PASC research cohort, uh, P2RC, um, and it has a lot of benefits. What, how many, three minutes, okay. So some of the benefits. First of all, it improves precision and prevalence estimation and reduces bias. So, um, so in terms of in, in, in phenotyping um, long COVID, so there's not a lot of rules, right? So the one, there is an ICD code that we compared our algorithm with. One of the things is that there's a UO9.9 diagnosis code. So what we got in terms of prevalence is much closer to the estimated uh, regional and nat national prevalence. So if you use U0909 diagnosis code, we, you get a much smaller number of patients than if you use uh, this, this algorithm that we use, so the precision phenotyping algorithm. And then the distribution of the patients is much more closer to the regional distribution. So we have the details in our paper, but we looked at, you know, uh, if you look at the U0909 code, it's heavily biased. There's several biases in it, right? Healthcare processes and all that. But it's heavily biased to uh, towards certain population, white, female, all those. Um, and then, but our, our result, our cohort is much closer, much, much closer to the distribution of population in the, in the New England or Massachusetts region. Another thing you get is that it enables in-depth analysis of clinical, genetic, and demographic differences in risk, uh, in risk of PASC, you know, because it offers very precise definitions, um, 
very precise information on every individual, and it offers a large sample. So we have about a, a, a cohort of 85,000 uh, patients. 20, about 25 of them have been, 25,000 of them have been labeled. Uh, so we can now answer a whole bunch of different questions that you know, curating a just a broadly defined cohort cannot get to. There are barriers, so multi-site implementation and validation. This is not a specific to these precision phenotyping algorithm, but I think in, in uh, precision phenotyping algorithms are going to require a little bit more um, resources in terms of compute than just like simple phenotyping algorithms. Uh, distributed learning is an area has been has not been evaluated. So because there is so many functions, there are going to be different types of parameters. So how do you compare? Is there a gold gold standard? Um, so I think uh, so it requires basically foundation models for supervised, unsupervised learning that are not available currently. Uh, and then um, use cases in genetic, metabolomic, and clinical trials aren't available. We are producing those use cases at the moment. Uh, I think when the use cases come out, uh, there will be more motivation. But I think this is basically the, uh, the direction and future. And I just wanted to thank the Clay team and our collaborators and these funders. Thank you. Sean has a question. Super interesting as always, uh, Jose. I noticed that the last slide, distributed learning or federated learning, right, is going to be key to um, being able to actually, you know, apply these kinds of insights across large swaths of healthcare centers and really get the compendium of knowledge from them into, you know, these kinds of advanced tools. Um, do you see that happening through I2B2? And um, you know, what kind of investment do you think we need to make to kind of proceed with that? That's a great question. I think, I mean, it's relevant to I2B2. So all of this work is basically based on, you know, Jeff Klon's loyalty cohort and uh, uh, ENAC data, right? So these are all I2B2, and we've been trying to implement it at I I2B2. We are, I think we are, what we need to do in terms of investment is, and we are just thinking about it. Um, so you're gonna have several different functions, several different ways. So you, you will, we are gonna need to be able to compare them. So what we need to do, we need to be able to curate validated data sets at different institutions. Or if we don't curate them, there is ways to still um, you know, to compare these things. We are working on um, these you know, visual analytic dashboards to compare, uh, for example, if you train a, a temporal association matrix uh, with these sequences that we mine on two different uh, institutions, are they similar or not? So we are basically building those things uh, to, to figure out, oh, if, if things are very different, then Maybe this, you know, what we have done at MGB is not applicable to PIT, but, but you know, we, we would have to do those kind of things. Um, um, I don't know how exactly it could fit within the I2B2 framework because the compute part has, um, you know, there's another conversation we've been having. Compute part is a little ex more expensive than regular models. We need to think that through, though, for the future because that's, Definitely, it's the future way that we need to go. Exactly, yeah. Very good. Thank you. Okay, thank you.